For those of you joining us uh, from Open Track, uh, I have sports car racing legend here, Jack Baldwin. And I just wanted to tell a little personal story about Jack before I get into asking him a few questions about his you know, racing background, his history. Uh, you know, when I started racing, I was a little older than most. Uh, I, was, I don't think I had my first go-kart race till I was 20 years old. And, and it took me eight years to get to World Challenge. And when I got there, I was, you know, I felt like I was already the old guy. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I looked at the entry list and I saw Jack Baldwin was all that. Geez, Jack Baldwin's racing uh, in our class. And so I, 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 I recognized the name, but I was like, it can't be the same Jack, you know? So I, I Googled your name and looked up uh, all your, you know, stats and your history and everything. And I was like, geez, I wonder, like, you know, how quick Jack will be, you know? He's in his mid 60s at, at that point, you know? And so, you know, practice came around and I remember just having a mirror full of your Porsche right from the beginning. And I was like, if he's still that fast, at 60s, like I'm, I've still got plenty of time, you know, like, it, like put all that doubt to rest that I was old or I was going to be close to getting over the hill as far as race driver age was concerned. Uh, so you're like the, you're like the Tom Brady of sports car racing, man. You were like oh. up at the front of the grid till the very, very end. So it was pretty awesome. <clears throat> Well, that's cool. I have so I have something to add to that, Andy. So mm -hmm. when we brought the Cayman to World Challenge, you know, we started that whole process. Mm -hmm. All I heard about was Andy Lee, Andy Lee, Andy Lee. Huh. Everybody's telling me you're going to have to deal with Andy Lee, Andy Lee, Andy Lee, and I'm like, <laughs> who, who is this guy, Andy Lee? Yeah, <laughs> well, we were, we're on the grid that day. Remember, we were on the grid. Yeah. I walked over yeah. and I said, "Are you Andy Lee?" <laughs> and you said, yeah. And I said, well, I, I want to meet you because you know, I've heard all of it. So this is Andy Lee. Yeah. You know? All right. So we're good. Uh, that's ridiculous. That's hilarious. Yeah. And um, so that was the beginning. So anyway. Yeah, it was, man. And uh, I think, you know, for a lot of the young drivers, you know, I think you kind of became like a mentor to a lot of us. You know, because you'd been around the sport, you know, and in so many different realms and different series, different classes, different cars. And uh, and so I, I always felt like if there was something I didn't understand or I needed advice on, like your trailer was the place to go. Uh, so, you know, it was it was good times for me, for sure. And, and it helped me kind of advance maybe a little quicker uh, because of those little interactions we had. A few that I, I wish we didn't have, but... <laughs> There was a couple I wish we yeah. could kind of rerun, uh -huh. uh, but, uh, you know, that's that happens, and you just have yeah. to, you know, you just, it, it's good and it's bad. You know, it's just the way it is. That's racing. So, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, uh, you know, so, yeah. I, the, the thing, uh, let me just add some stuff in here. I mean, yeah, the thing that I liked, Andy, and what I like to see, and, and I was really impressed with you, is you were doing it the old-fashioned way. You mm -hmm. were doing it the way we did it, the way I did it, you know. You didn't have a lot of money. You had a lot of determination, a lot of drive. And, you, you know, you were just you had to make it happen. So you did it however you could do it. And uh, and, you know, you towed the car, worked on the car, you know, uh, you know, didn't have any money, just had to make it work. I, I was always impressed with that. Um, I appreciate it. That's how I did it. I mean, that's how a lot of us did it. That's how I definitely did it. I didn't have anything either. And uh, and like you say, you didn't start till you were 20. I didn't start till I was 21 because, yeah. well, I think it was at 21 because in those days you couldn't get a license till you were 21. <laughs> so, um, so I. Well, you had to be able to drink in the paddock back then, right? Like that was the thing. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, so I, you know, I started, I won the U.S. championship when I was 23 in Formula Ford, which was a huge deal in those years. And, and I was 23 years old. And I won that thing and um, got to go to the world championships and stuff like that. And, and Formula Ford, that was a big deal. I mean, that was like, if you were Formula Ford, I mean, that was like, okay, the next step, you're going to, you know, you're going to be, a, you know, that was the big qualifier. But I didn't have any money. I yeah. didn't have any money. So, you know, and it was from 23 to 35 before I got the break. And all the, in those years in the middle, I mean, I tried all kinds of things, 
And I drove a lot and we drove back and forth. We did some stuff. Joe Vardy and I did some stuff and we won. We always, always trying, always doing something, always in the game, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but that's the naivety I think you have as like a young driver. And I certainly had it. Um, is, uh, you know, I thought a lot of this was more result based, merit based. And that's how, you know, you move up through the sport. But, you know, you learn, you know, early on, you know, that that's not the case. It's, it's, it's yeah, you had to be behind the scenes. From the beginning, um, it was it was opportunity. It was the opportunity. Um, you know, it was if I could just get the chance, get the opportunity. And it was trying to. It was it was it was it was building that. It was trying to get yourself in a position to get that opportunity. And a lot of times, I mean, I got um, and the disappointing thing was. I'd get with teams and work on this and do this and do this and work on the car. Cause I did all that in those years. Yeah. Um, did whatever it took. Uh, but um, a lot of times, right at the last bit, mm-hmm. somebody with some money would come up and buy that rod right out from under me. And I'd get the call a, to, a week or two before the race saying, Hey, you know, I'm sorry, but I got to let someone to the drive who wasn't yeah. as good as me. Right. And there's no question. And, Right. There was there was one guy that did that right before the runoffs, and mm-hmm. I would have won the. I, there's no doubt. Yeah. And, um. Well, I mean, there's always a doubt. You crash. Yeah. Well, sure. Sure. But I, uh, he, he, a doctor, a dentist, come in and bought that rod, and I just, I was real. I, I wasn't happy about it, and he, but he, he did miserable, and I remember at those years I was working for Road Atlanta. I was the original driving instructor and sort of, you know, one of the key people at the racetrack in those years. And uh, he he brought, he called me in May of that year after the, and he said, you know, I haven't touched that car since, uh, uh, you know, since the runoffs. So I've been so pissed off about it and, mm-hmm. and blah, blah, blah. And I said, he said, I just got to know. And I said, well, what have you done to the car? He said, nothing. It's sitting here with flat tires. I said, just put air in the tires and bring it to the damn track. So he brought the track, drove it in the paddock. We were yeah. unloaded the car. We put same tires, mm-hmm. put air in the tires, took it out there. I went about five laps, was way faster than the track record. I said, <laughs> I mean, I'll never forget. I looked at him and I said, yep. That was a bad decision. You screwed up. You don't want it, man. But you know, it yeah. caused. I think I would have won the national championship. That would have been nice. You know, I mean, it might even have helped me move along. Beats me. Might have meant nothing. The U.S. championship, yeah, was great, but it, yeah. it didn't mean anything. Right. I mean, it meant something. I, I was the U.S. champion, but everybody called me up and said, "How much money do you have?" And I go. Mm-hmm. Uh, I might be able to come up with 500 bucks. You got nothing. <laughs> we're like, so that's it? And I go, well, you know, uh, my dad was good for 20 bucks on a Friday night, you know? Yeah. Well, I, used to, I got those calls early too, like especially after, you know, a little world challenge success, I'd, I'd start getting phone calls, you know, from teams. And I started getting excited because I was like, oh, wow. You know, I've, this is how it works, you know? Like you win yeah. a few races and then – there you go. You start climbing the ladder and uh, you get on the phone with these guys and they're like, yeah, we really want you to drive for us. Um, how much money you got? <laughs> and you're like, oh, it's so like disappointing, you know, but that's just the way it is. Well, there was a time, you know, early on when I would go to everybody and I would talk about how I could win. Yeah. You let me drive. I can win. I can win. I can win. I'll win. Win, win, win. As a young guy. One day a guy says to me, and I didn't have any mentors. I didn't, my yeah. dad wasn't engaged. I didn't know. I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, I just did. Yeah. I thought this is a good idea. This was yeah. a good idea. <laughs> yeah. I'd go down this road and I'd go like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But how did I know? You know, I was just a kid. I was just throwing mud at the wall. So yeah. I, one day he said to me, uh, and I think he was frustrated at me because I was pounding away at him, you know, just, I wouldn't give up. Mm-hmm. And he said, Jack, he said, Everyone knows you're fast. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows you can win. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows you're a good driver. So you don't need to sell that. Yeah. What you need to do is you need to focus on how to come up with the money. Yeah. And stop talking about selling yeah. yourself. You don't need to sell yourself. 
Everyone knows you're good, but you need, and I was like, really? Hmm. Hadn't dawned on my, <laughs> and from that point on, I was like, okay, let's, let's focus on the money. Let's focus on putting it together. And, um, and then, you know, I remember struggling for years and trying a lot of stuff, but I remember there was some things like Richard Petty said, I remember a statement he made and he said, and I was a break, I was a student of the sport. I, I was looking at everything, reading everything. I mean, I was, this is what I was going to do. And I remember Richard Petty saying one time in, a, in an interview or something, he says, well, you get told no. Uh, he says, you know, you get told no 99 times and you get told once, yes, once you're one ahead. Mm -hmm. But well, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. To me, that makes sense. I'm like, okay, so I'm just going to keep going till I got a yes. You know, I wasn't willing to give up because yeah. The, the, the problem with that was I said the easiest way to fail is to quit. And once I quit, we're done. I mean, yeah. if I stop trying, then, you know, so if I quit, then I failed. I mean, and I wasn't willing to look back and say, you know what, if I'd have kept trying, maybe you'd have made it. I just was, I was just so determined to. And then the other problem is, you know, once or twice a year, I'd get in a car. Somewhere, I don't know, you know, Barty called me up and said, I need you to drive this car. I want to, he's always up something, you know, and, uh, and I would do good. I mean, I was like, boom, man. like up front, man, it's like, whoa. And, I'm, and I, I said, you know, I know I can do this. Yeah. You know, it's, like, it's like, it just re, I'd almost, there were some pretty dark years and I almost wished it, I failed in a lot of ways because I always said, you know what, maybe I'm not that good. And I'm okay. I can I can walk away from this. But the problem is, every time I got a shot at something, I put the car up front. Almost won the race. Won the race. I mean, uh, so it, it just drove me. It's like I know I can do this. I know I can do this. I know, and I just wasn't willing to. Uh, I wasn't willing to give up. So I didn't get a break till I was 35. There was, was a first break. Now I'd already won. I'd already won. Two Camel GT races, uh, GTU races, racing with Joe Vardy. And yeah. These are big stuff. I mean, we won the Lumberman's 500, and we won um, we won Sonoma. In a so GTU you, in the, you get guys like, kind of like uh, an idea of like what, what was Camel GT back then? Like what, what was it the equivalent to now? Well, IMSA. Yeah, yeah. IMSA. It was IMSA. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was, it was IMSA. It was yeah. it was John and Peggy Bishop, which mm -hmm. are the original. Yeah, you know, they started it, right? So it's kind of uh, like IMSA GTD, almost. Uh -huh. Yeah, mm -hmm. GT. It would be like um, mm -hmm. back in those years. They had GTU, GTO, and GTP. Mm -hmm. So GTU was under three liters. GTO mm -hmm. was over three liters, and then mm -hmm. GTP was prototype. Yeah, simple. So it was RX seven uh, mm -hmm. Porsches. You know, like a nine. Uh, 28 or whatever it is, uh, you know, the turbo, a 944. I mean, um, those cars, yeah, and some mostly it was Mazdas. I mean, it was there were some Datsuns out there, stuff yeah. like that. But the big class, the big thing was, um, was uh, the G, the Mod Dark Sevens, and then, um, and then GTO was, you know, your Camaros and your Mustangs and your uh, Corvettes and things, you know, V8s, that stuff, that stuff, and so then. Before you get to the, the break you got, um, I, you mentioned something and it, it just sparked a memory for me too. And I thought maybe we could dig into it a little bit was um, just kind of the bad advice you get. Like I, I remember early on, like after I was you know doing really well in karting, like trying to get into cars, you know, the, the, all the drivers would tell me, oh, you know what you got to do is you just go down to Daytona during the test days before the 24. Yeah. And you just go from one trailer to the next and try to offer your services, you know? And so I did that for like three years in a row. I'd go down there with, I had no money. I could barely afford the plane ticket to get down there. And then, you know, you go from one trailer to the next and the team owners have heard it, you know, 50 times that weekend from other guys like me that got poor advice. And so I was wondering if there's other things like that that you did that were just, you're like, God, why did I do that? What, what a waste of time. Well, I mean, I, I, I did those things. I mean, I tried, 
tried yeah. to get rides here, tried to get rides there, tried to put deal. But once I got that, <clears throat> once I realized it was about the money, yeah, <clears throat> and that was in my late twenties. Mm -hmm. And you've heard the story, and it's a long story, but how I got into the rock and roll business. Mm -hmm. I thought I've heard bits and pieces of that story. So the short version mm -hmm. is um, I decided, hey, <clears throat> I'm not getting anywhere and I can't find a sponsor. Uh, I just can't do it. Now, let, let's let's put a little bit in here. In those years, 74, there was a big depression in this country. Yeah. You know, gas, you know, interest rates were crazy 20 percent and you know like everything was crazy so i'm out there i knew nothing about the economy and i'm out there talking to everybody and of course the whole the whole market's in, in dev, you know it's devastated so i'm there's no way i'm gonna find anything you know and uh, but anyway um i i just decided you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna i can't I, i'm not getting anywhere so i'm gonna stop trying to do this <clears throat> I'm going to get into business. <clears throat> I'm going to focus. I'm going to, for five years, this is my plan. I was a young guy. Five <laughs> years, I'm going to be in business for five years. I'm going to make enough money in five years that I'll sponsor myself. <laughs> so, yep. That's true race car mentality. Race yep, driver that's mentality. It. Five years. Go ahead and get it done. <laughs> Uh -huh. I got into the t-shirt business, which uh -huh. a friend of mine was in it. And I, yeah. and so, but I was thinking big, big. And, I wasn't interested in selling to the local bar and the local restaurant. And I was interested in something bigger. So my first account was I tracked down Evil Knievel. Yeah. And I got the international marketing merchandise for Evil Knievel. And we became great friends through the years. Huh. So, I mean, I tracked him down and literally tracked him down in yeah. Clearwater, Florida, knocked yeah. on his door. I don't know how you would find him. I mean, back in those days, yeah. I would tell you, Evil's in room 19. <laughs> And I'm not yeah, nine o'clock in the morning. It's crazy. And yeah. I had a picture of me flying through the air on a motorcycle. Still got that picture. Yeah. And I had a picture of me, you know, flying through the air on a, on a Yamaha. And I held up this picture and said, hey, I'm like you. <laughs> I'm just going to do this deal. So, um, yeah, so that was, it was that. And then I, I got into the rock and roll business through a, a guy that I met at Daytona in the Goodyear Lounge. And, uh, you know, and it happened to be Aerosmith. It was before Aerosmith with Aerosmith. Yeah. I, so I was their original T-shirt supplier. So wow. if if you look at black, I was the first one ever to print a black T-shirt with silver wings, Aerosmith. Huh. And I had, so the company we worked with was called T-shirtery. Yeah. And we did 80% of the rock and roll tour business in the United States. So if you got a concert T-shirt. In that era, it was your one of your T-shirts. The what? If if you bought a T-shirt at a concert back then, that was probably one of your T-shirts. Uh, well, it could have been. It, yeah. What? What? At least for the company, like I, yeah. my accounts, the the mm -hmm. accounts that I had were uh, Aerosmith, Kiss, mm -hmm. uh, ACDC, Boston, mm -hmm. and Ted Nugent. Wow. Those were my accounts. Those were my players. So now other guys had other things, you know, they had different, but these are the guys that I met and people that I met and like, you know, when Boston came in, I flew to LA and met the manager and, you know, and I dealt with the managers and I, I really wasn't a rock and roller. I was a racer, but it's like, I used to say, I used to go to the conscious all the time. And I was like, hey, rock and roll. I'm just doing this so I can go racing, you know? Did it, did it fund some racing, though? Did it? Did you make enough off of that? To... No. Hell no. <laughs> no, I, I had a retail business. I had the largest custom T-shirt store in the United States across from the biggest record store at the time, Peaches on Peachtree, was the largest yeah. record store. And my store was right across the street. It was called T-shirtery Company Store. And so... Mm -hmm. um, because I would just walk in the back and write an order and go, I want three of these, three of these, three of these. So I had, yeah. I had tour shirts in every different color and yeah. every size and all different stuff that you couldn't get at the concert. So gotcha. like we had the Beatles, Chicago, you, Elton John. I mean, you, we had everybody. We had it rocking, uh, Rolling Stones. I mean, you, you name it, we had it. Uh, <laughs> so and it's, the problem is 
the more I got it, it, it made me a pretty good living. Um, but it certainly wasn't enough to go racing. And finally, I my accountant told me, he said, either you're willing to go to that store every day and work that store and work your business, yeah. or or you need to, it's not going to work. Yeah. And because I people were stealing from me and there was a lot of stuff going on. And when I realized, and it's crazy, but when I realized that this road that I was on was not going to take me where I thought it was, mm -hmm. I sold the business. Mm -hmm. I told it. I walked into the guys that owned the factory. Yeah. And I they wanted that business bad. <laughs> so I walked right, in. Here you go, man. Take it. Said, Steve, you want this thing? And he said, Yeah, absolutely. I said, then oh, this is what I want for it. And I probably sold it too cheap. Who knows? Yeah. Cash. Wasn't enough to go racing. Yeah. Um, I had some, they gave me some money and oh, away we went. Uh, and we went in, you know, trying other things. And uh, so what led to the break then when you turned 35? You, you you tried all these things and, you know, you, and that's a that's late, man. Like I, I for me, I'm, I'm 38 now. And, and man, that's a long time to be patient. Well, we did, you know, it, we didn't have coaching in those years. Yeah. No coaches. Yeah. They had no coaches. You just, and there was no, was none of the like they have now. No. I yeah. mean, uh, you got a license through uh, SCCA. Yeah. And you had to get, you know, learn, you know, you get, you went through all the stages and to get a national license and you'd go from there. And mm -hmm. so the next thing, I was still in the t-shirt business, but I got out of rock and roll. Mm -hmm. It was more or less in corporate stuff. So I was doing like copper tone, things like that, you know, yeah. print, you know, point of purchase type things, you know, where you'd like, Hey, get a free t-shirt or whatever like that. And so, and yeah. I was selling a bunch of them, you know, I mean, I was shipping them, you know, I had some big accounts and I was making a good living. I yeah. was rich. I just make a living. I was a, I was a 30 year old making a living, you know? And, yeah. um, but I used to come up with good ideas. I'd come up with ideas. I'd, I'd come up with about one a year. And one of my ideas was the, uh, the like a uh, like a painting a Corvette like a sneaker. Mm -hmm. Back to U.S. <laughs> heads was a big deal. And I airbrushed this Corvette like a sneaker and the, 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 the super shoe. Yeah. We call it the super shoe. And, I, I you know, can you imagine a Daytona? This thing's going around the speedway and you look at it, it looks like a sneaker flying in. <laughs> you had this rendering of this Corvette, and it kind of looked like a sneaker, you know? It was, yeah. We didn't know vinyl. Everything had to be painted. Everything had to be. Yeah. But anyway, so I, I tried that, and that that worked pretty good, except I got screwed out of the deal, and the guy who presented it got the job with the advertising agency in New York because <laughs> it was so creative. They, they hired the guy. Oh, man. Right. You know, but there's no race, ride, no ride out of it, though. No, he got a job. I got nothing, <laughs> you know. But um, I made a lot of mistakes, Andy. But then um, um, I the other idea that I had was uh, with Chrysler uh, when they had their front wheel drive cars, their K cars, and all that kind of thing, and um, the yeah. Shelby Dodge. Yeah. So my good friend Joe Vardy, mm -hmm. who's still my very good friend, you might know Joe Vardy know the name he i know the name but never met him yet <laughs> well he's one of the most he is the most successful mm -hmm. gs type racer mm -hmm. firestone firehawk you know mm -hmm. michelin today michelin gs you know michelin cup he is the most successful by far mm -hmm. uh, he now today he runs uh ted giovannis's program tmg okay so he runs that program before that he was uh like the bacardi car Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Joe is one hundreds. I mean, he's been behind a lot of things. Very successful guy. He and I are from Tampa. Okay. And um, so I had this idea with Dodge about this Dodge, and I told Joe, I said, you know, um, this is an idea. You know, I I told him I had this idea. So uh, one thing led to I don't, I'm not sure how it happened on the other side, but he met uh, Maxwell. Uh, what was his name? Uh, uh, Don Maxwell, uh, great guy. Worked, ran the Chrysler Performance Program, and um, so he. I'm working one day, and and uh, I'm at this other T-shirt company now. The the, the competitor of, because I I'm just you know working for a guy who big company that prints them right. Mm -hmm. And Joey calls me one day and he says, "What are you doing?" 
I said, I'm just sitting here at my desk being bored. <laughs> and he said, you want to go to mid Ohio? And I said, for what? Yeah. Not, at that point I was pretty disgusted about the whole thing. I was, it's yeah. like, uh, for what? And, uh, and he says, oh, I got this new Dodge. Uh, I got this new Chrysler New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, where in the hell do you get a New Yorker? He says, well, you know that Dodge deal you told me about? He said, well, I got the Dodge deal. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you got to go with me because we got to figure out how to do this, Jack. I don't know how to do this. I don't know what to do. And so here's Joe and Jack. We never up in, I said, yeah. Come. He came by, picked me up. I jumped in the car. We took off. We went to mid-Ohio. And we weren't doing the Dodge Geo then, but that was the beginning of it. Yeah. And we were going up there to meet with them or whatever like this. And one thing led to another. Anyway, it was the two years of that. I was yeah. sort of a team manager, and I drove the other car. We had two yeah. cars, 01 and 02. And, uh, and then uh, I, I towed the race car. You know, we had a truck called Agony, and it, it was Agony. And <laughs> I drove it. And, uh, and there's all kinds of stories in there, you know, but we were doing it like you did. We had a truck like that. Yeah. Yeah. We did it like you did. I mean, I was yeah. towing, I was, we were at a Dodge with a, we had a Dodge Dually with a 360 gas engine. It had a range mm -hmm. of 200 miles and we had a flatbed trailer with a car cover. And here's this factory Dodge charger, mm -hmm. Shelby charger sitting underneath it. And <laughs> that's how we got to the, that's how we did it. And we just pulled up and did it. And, so that's when you were 35. That's so 30. I wasn't, I was 30, probably 33 then. Okay. Yeah. 33, 34. So I did that a couple of years. We won the years. championship. We won the championship. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, so that was it. We, Joe won it. And that program sort of stopped. Mm -hmm. And they all do. Of course. Yeah. So this is how it went down. So here I'm 35 years old. I've got years invested in this. I've been chasing this lifetime dream for all these years. And, um, you know, and back up when I, when I was a little kid, I always knew what I wanted to do. I don't know where I got this from, but I always wanted to be a race car driver. So that was what I, you know, and my dad didn't really give me a lot of direction. So I'm chasing this dream. So now fast forward 35, <clears throat> I don't, I don't have any money. Yeah. I've got years invested into this. I'm 30 now I'm 35 years old and I'm like how many more years are you going to keep doing this because you know you're 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 in debt I owed my mm -hmm. mother some money mm -hmm. um and I I wasn't seriously in debt but I was in debt and I didn't have any money and mm -hmm. I had no life direction at that point other than I want to be a race car driver right um and I so I I got to a point where honestly it was the beginning of the year. My mother called me up and she said, son, what are you going to do? I said, well, mom, I don't know. She says, well, you need to pay me back. <laughs> and and uh, so, you know, like when I won the U.S. championship, my dad, dad bought the motor, but then I had to sell the motor to give the money back to him. So, um, <laughs> I never, I never, you know what I mean? It was like yeah. good and bad. So, yeah, how are you going to pay me back? And I said, mom this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to go until I think I want to say it was, it was a period of time. It was like two more weeks or maybe it was in the month. Yeah. I said, I am going to, if I cannot get something going, if I can't put together something, get a job in racing, do something <clears throat> by the end of the month, I'm going to, I'm going to walk away from this. I'm going to yeah. leave it behind me and, <clears throat> I've got to, I've got to do something with my life. I can't continue. I'm 35 years old now. It's like, yeah. this is working. You know, I got a lot of years that ain't working. Right. So at some point you got to be realistic. So at first I was all like all bummed out. Like, oh man, I was all depressed. And, <clears throat> you know, I guess. Uh, and then I thought to myself, hell no, if this is it, if this is it, mm -hmm. then I'm going to go round the clock wide open. I'm going to go all the way to the end. I'm going to do everything I can do. So when it, if it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to, I can't look back and say, you know what, if you tried damn harder, you might've pulled it off. Mm -hmm. So I round the clock, I'm on the phone, boom, boom, boom. I'm working every deal. So I called Jim Downing looking for a job. Yeah. You know who Jim Downing is. Yeah. You can tell the audience though. So well, was Jim Downing was the, well, he, the, he's the most known. He was a really like a pioneer in the Mazda mm -hmm. world. 
right? Okay. Jim Downing. And he was the inventor of the Hans device. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. And if you look at the early, you look at the early Mazda, which is by the way, Mazda is mm -hmm. when it comes to worldwide racing, yeah, it's bigger than Porsche. Oh, yeah. Mazda is serious about yeah. racing. And so, so you call, call him and so I called him. I called Jim and I said, uh, you know, Jim, I'm I'm just looking for something. I'm just yeah. looking for anything. You got anything? His shop was here in town. And Jim okay. was Jim was he was doing pretty well. <clears throat> and he was going into uh camel lights. He was the father of camel light, which is the smaller prototype class, right? Mm -hmm. so they had GTP and then they had camel light, which was the like a a, a prototype with a three liter or smaller motor. Kind of like an LMP2 or an LMP3. Exactly. Car, like Same, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> so he said to me, he said, he said, Jack, he said, have you ever heard of this guy named Ira Young? Mm -hmm. I said, actually, I have. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, well, he's buying my race car, mm -hmm. the RX-7. Okay. And he said, and I, he asked me who... I thought would be somebody that could help put that team together, and make that whole deal work. And he said, I gave him your name. Wow. So he'd already, um, already put you up there. So yeah. he said, here's Ira's number. Call him. Yeah. So I called Ira. I didn't forget, you know, California. Yeah. So I call Ira, you know, all fired up. It's midnight. there. <laughs> <laughs> Nick. So I go out there yeah. um, to, to meet him. I didn't yeah. know. Ira owned Malibu Grand Prix. Okay. Gotcha. That's who Ira was. He was a Canadian that had bought yeah. Malibu Grand Prix and was turning it around. So I, I, I went out there and I had no money. We're talking yeah. no money now. Yeah. So I had good credit. I didn't screw my credit up and I still had a credit card. So I was, I said, well, I'm just going to go out there. Ira said, I want you to come out. I'll pay your way out. You know, I want you to come and see me and, We'll go from there. And he, and I'm th I, thankful he said, I'll pay your way. I'll buy you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and I remember I went out there and I thought, I'm just going to be real conservative. And then I thought, no way. I'm going to dress up. I'm going to look the part. I'm going to, I rented a, I said, I'm not renting some dumpy little, I'm going to rent a brand. I'm going to rent a Thunderbird. You yeah. Know? <laughs> so I came driving up. I was looking the part, went in there. Yeah, and it was him and Clayton Cunningham, which you I don't know if you know Clayton. No, he was chief back in those days, pretty yeah. famous guy, and it was him was sitting in a room, and he says to me, he says, "What? Why should I choose you?" Hmm. And I looked at him right in the face. I said, "Because I'll win." <laughs> I'll win. And so, month years later, you know, I said to Ira. I said, so when you saw me and we were talking, what what impression did you have of me? <laughs> <laughs> he said, when I saw you, he said, I saw the look of a desperate man. <laughs> so all that facade like, of car and so I'm like, you yeah. know, so he said, I knew when you said you were gonna win. Uh, yeah. and so when I that so that deal started. So yeah. some very famous people. I mean, we're on that team. Danny Banks being one of them was the yeah. mechanic. Danny was behind, you know, with Pratt and Miller for all those years. We had Tommy Kendall. Danny yeah. Banks is a very well-known, pretty famous guy. And there were some other, Mark Honsowitz, and who works for Ed Pink now. And, you know, a lot of really star guys were on this little, we had this little shop in El Segundo that was so little that you had to take the fenders and the tires, the wheels off the car to get it in the shop. The RX-7? It was just a little, teeny small. little shop. And, <laughs> Jesus. And we went out there, and we we were racing against factory teams. And yeah. Roger Mandeville and those guys, mm -hmm. and we, we – and, I mean, I towed the car. Mm -hmm. I did whatever – I remember standing – we were getting ready to go to the first Rolex, mm -hmm. and the I was sitting in the dually because – I go bought a dually and I got the trailer while the guys were getting the car ready. And you know, they bought Jim's car. And so they but they were turning it around. And I remember I'm sitting in the dually in El Segundo, and the guy who's supposed to drive the dually says to me that he changed his mind. And he starts him and Han. Hmm. 
And I looked at him. I threw that thing up in park, and I looked at him, and I said, let me tell you something. Just because you're not going to drive this thing, that doesn't mean it's going to get there. You just tell me you're going to be in the truck or not. And he didn't get in the truck. So I put in gear and drove it to Daytona. And that was it. And we won that race. And um, that was my Rolex win. I drove 13 hours of that race. And um, we had some trouble early. We got way behind. And I remember coming through turn one every lap, pounding the laps out, pounding them out, pounding them out, pounding them out. And I remember I was just in my mind, I kept saying, when you ain't got nothing, you ain't got nothing to lose. And I just kept pounding out that lap. So every so many hours, I would get back one lap. Like wow. every three hours, I, I drove 13 and a half hours of the, I drove all night long, all night long until like, I don't know, daylight. And then yeah. I rest for a little bit and then I finished it out. And I think maybe it'll be let Ira take the flag. I'm not sure, but yeah. we ended up catching, we were laps, we were 12 laps down or something like that. And yeah. you can't catch up in today's world, but no. back in those days, I mean, we were, I was doing qualifying laps all the whole time. Yeah. And the car was going to either stay together or not stay together. Yeah, it didn't matter. At that point, you had matter. to get it didn't matter. Back, so it wouldn't matter. So we won that race, and then we yeah. went to Sebring, and we won that race. Yeah. And so that kind of like cemented you. Like, that was like, that well, was it. I just won the Rolex. Yeah. I just won the 12 hours of Sebring. Yeah. And then we went to Watkins Glen and won that one. And <laughs> I was, you know, and listen, we were racing Dan Gurney. Yeah. We were racing Gurney. We were racing Elliot Forbes Robinson and the Porsche. Yeah, um, we had some competition, and we had the factory. We had the factory Mazda team, uh, Roger Mandeville, and um, I remember all I said just when we qualified. Just said, just tell me where Roger is. Just tell me where. <laughs> Roger is. And when Roger went to GTO in a Mazda, yeah. I still was in GTO, and I remember I said, just tell me, did I have out? All I want to do is out qualify Roger. <laughs> and I would out qualify him in a GTO car. I would out qualify him in a GTU car. And uh, it was tough. I mean, back in those days, let me tell you something, man. Those cars were crude. Oh, it was yeah. hot. I yeah. mean, hot, loud. Uh, yeah. It was. It was brutal. And you know, it was. You just had to make it. Make it happen. I mean, yeah. The car was never perfect. It was never right. If it was side. If it. If it was loose, you drove it loose and managed the tires. And if it was tight, you had to throw it in there. I mean, you know, it was different. It, it, the cars were much good, but the Mazas were reliable. And if you didn't overheat it and didn't over rev it, yeah, it would keep keep going. And uh, I didn't wreck the car. Didn't we couldn't afford to wreck? We didn't wreck nothing. And um, I mean, we banged it up. <laughs> we banged it up. A bunch. Oh yeah, no, yeah. We try but, to try not to, but yeah. But, but I mean, so that, and that's what started it. So then, you know, I won two back to back. And those days, Camel, uh, Camel GT, that was the epitome. I mean, the Miami Grand Prix, you know, uh, you know, all, all the top big races were Camel GT races, and uh, so I became, you know, one of their top drivers. And I had my my stats. I remember one time I looked at some stats, and there was, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Hobart, and I was second. I'm like, check this out, <laughs> you know. And percentage and wins and mm -hmm. polls and stuff like that. And, you know, and then from there, I went to GTO with the Peerless. And that's a whole nother story when I wanted to go to, uh, when I wanted to move out of GTU. Yeah. And I needed to move because that deal was running out. Well, and I knew we, I, need, I needed to get to the next one. You know, before if I was we get to, beyond that, before we get to GTO, uh, like, uh, you know, all that, that story is, do you think that that can be done today? Like the way that, that the way that you came up through racing, the way that I came up through racing, um, I get I get asked all the time, and I'm sure there's people that are watching this interview and and thinking, you know, I have a son, I have a daughter, I have you know, they they want to pursue this path, you know, or they have the aspirations to do so, or maybe it's just somebody that's been doing track day events for a long time, or maybe racing club racing, and they're like, yeah, I want to try my hand at that. I I, I always struggle to say. You know, you could do it the same way as I did it because I, I think maybe you and I got extremely lucky, you know, but maybe maybe it's possible. I don't know. But I'm curious, like, do you think that's that can be done again? One of the problems yeah. today is back then we built our race cars. Yeah, true. 
You built your Camaro. We built them, yeah. Yeah, a bunch of volunteers. Yeah. And I the Cayman that we you and I raced against each other in GTS, I yeah. we built that Cayman. Yeah. Now today they're homologated. Yeah. So where you can maybe build a car with your buddy in your shop and somebody helping you out. And maybe you could build a car for mm-hmm. let's just say a number, hundred grand. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which sounds like a lot, but when we built our first car, I think that's about what it took. It was like 120 grand or something, which right. well, was astronomical to me at the time, but this well, is nothing that's a lot of money, but it's not 300. Yeah. Yeah. Now you can't, you can't, the, the car, the homologation, like GT4 America, mm-hmm. it's good and bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, the, the, you know, when, when we had the team, Mm-hmm. Uh, GT Sport, and we were running the Camaro, uh, the Caymans. A lot of people wanted to run with me. Yeah, I, did, I only had two cars, and it yeah. takes four or five months to build a car. Yeah. So I, there was, I had to say, you know, if I had a car, I'd run you. But I, I where am I going to get a car? Mm-hmm. Today's world, you could just go get a car, buy it. Yeah, and they're safer, and they're more expensive, and they're safer, and they're accessible. Mm-hmm. But, um. They are a lot more money. Yeah. So the price of admission has mm-hmm. gone up. Like in round numbers, a GT4 car now is what, 250, 300. Yeah, right? about that. Yeah. Now you can sell it, it has value. It's not like you're buying something that's going to go dud. But mm-hmm. still, I mean, uh, that's a long way from right. 120. And, um, and I think somewhere along the way, and it was probably about 15 to now it's probably been 20, but just use those numbers for conversation. Uh, you know, racing has sort of lost because of social, because of all the world today, it's sort of lost its commercial value. Mm-hmm. You know, if you look at the cars that I drove, I had real sponsors on the car and there was real commercial value going on. Yeah, Budweiser, Levi Garrett's, Gold Bandit, Hot Wheels, you know, yeah. this kind of thing. Chevy dealers were involved, all this stuff. Today, yeah. it was really, yeah, you know, race on Sunday, sell on Monday back then for sure. All, yes, all that was going on. And now today, it's not like that. So today, we're customer racing. We're, we're you know, uh, and that's what I do. I mean, being series director with GT4 America, I mean, where does our where does it come from? Well, it comes from mostly from professionals like yourself mm-hmm. that have a business that do, are, do professional coaching mm-hmm. and have clients. And so, cause everybody has a coach now. Yeah. More or less. You're, yeah. you're, it's it's like you're bringing your clients yeah. to into the next step. And because you can buy a car and go come in, you, and now the it's not back in those days there was racing teams yeah team owners hired race car drivers right because they needed their car yeah i i I always got paid to drive i made a living i my family i raised a family i I got paid to drive race cars yeah for all those years i mean and i had listen i had lean years and good years but i always got paid to drive i never drove for free never yeah and i never bought a ride never owned a race car except the cayman in the end yeah. But, um, but uh, today mm-hmm. we have service providers mm-hmm. because the car is homologated because you buy them for the manufacturers. So mm-hmm. the, the, the service providers, they don't build the car. They don't develop the car. Mm-hmm. They provide prep and execution. Right. And the professional coach, a guy like you that has a, a business that works with people, bringing them up. You bring them in. So in your case, you're working with GMG, right? One of the top service providers in the United States, easily. And you work and you have clients, you have several clients, and you bring your clients to the next step through GMG. Yeah. And so that's probably the path that I I usually advise, you know, younger, you know, people um, or you know, just people that want to, you know, take a shot at this is as you're saying, like, I, I think almost the only way you can do it, if you don't have the funding behind you, the family money, some sort of wealth, 
you got to be a coach. You, you got to work at a racing school. You got to learn how to coach and you got to get just, you know, somebody that, that wants to partner up with you uh, as an AM driver and take you along with them, really, if you want to go to the sports car. Route. And I'll be honest with you, the, the, the drivers that do the best yeah. in the series are not the, the guys in AM or, um, excuse me, in Sprint. Yeah. The, the guys that do the best are in Sprint X that right. have their coach with them. The right. ones that come and, oh, I'm going to come, but I don't want to. I'm going to drive by myself, right. and I'm going to run Sprint. And so they run GT America, which is the Sprint series. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, they struggle. Yeah, there's not they're much. They're themselves. They're like, now, if they have their coach, they're running both. That's a different story. You have clients that run both. Yeah. So you're coaching them on one side and drive one the other. You're looking over the data. You're doing it together. Mm -hmm. The ones that struggle are the ones that are over in – Sprint, they're by themselves. They don't have a coach. They don't really, they're going after the, they don't know what, you know, they're sort of lost. They get discouraged. Yeah. Those, the, if I can bring those and put those together with a coach mm -hmm. and get them in Sprint X, all of a sudden everything gets better for them. So yeah. they're much better. So back to your original question, it's so hard. There is a couple of guys that have broken through. Trent Henman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He broke through. He broke through. Yeah. He got himself in a position. Timing's everything. Timing yeah. is, is is so, I mean, it's everything. And even yeah. looking back at my career, I, I look at my timing on things. I mean, my, my Joni, my wife, who you know, mm -hmm. she 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 points out on occasion, <laughs> who is, if Scott Pruitt had to crash you in that 87 Columbus 500, yeah. you'd won the race and you'd have won the championship, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And then you'd have gotten IROC earlier because I did IROC <laughs> twice. And you did so well in IROC, you'd have probably had a career in NASCAR. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Like, thanks, Joni. Appreciate Thank it. You, <laughs> it you know, now the good news is Scott Pruitt and I are the best, are good friends now. And, you know, he, we were actually teammates at one, you know, in, in Trans Am years. And, yeah. you know, he said, hey, I did it on purpose, I, I'll admit. So you know, <laughs> that's a whole other story. But yeah, it's timing. My back to what I'm saying is timing everything. My yeah. phone called to, to Jim Downing. Have you ever yeah. heard of Ira Young? Yeah. Timing. What if yeah. I hadn't made the phone call? You, would Ira called me? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was there. It just worked out. And, you know, I mean, and things. Uh, so and then you've had the misses, too. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I remember one one of my first sponsors I ever had, and and this was going back to my karting days. Is and I was a I was just working at Bondurant at the racing school, and they had a karting school as well. And and uh, you know, we worked normally Monday through Friday, and uh, it was it was rare, you know, that we would get weekend customers for whatever reason. Um, but we had this one gentleman that kept calling. He's like, "Hey, I'd like to come in on a Saturday. I just kind of want to come in by myself and." And I just want to drive by myself. I don't want to be in a group. I don't want to be in a class. So I just want one-on-one, -on -one, one of your coaches. And I want to have a, we had shifter carts and all that. And all the guys that I worked with were like, almost like drawn straws, you know, to, who had to come in on the weekend to work with this guy. <laughs> and I was like, I'll just, I'll do it. You know, I'll come in, you know, and, and I came in and, and met the guy. He ended up being really influential. He ended up being one of my best sponsors for 10 years. And yeah. if I hadn't uh, taken that weekend course, you know, I never would have met him. Everything. But, yeah, it's everything. So everything. It, it, it so it's it's all. But I, I think the bottom line is, if you really want to do it, then try to do it. And yeah. and you know what, chase your dream. Yeah, give it the best you got. You know, if you don't make it to uh, the level that you originally wanted, mm -hmm. if you love to drive, drive. Yeah. You no, know? I mean, I've told a lot of guys. Look. Making this as a living, doing this as a, I want to make a living doing this, or yeah. do I want to do this? Yeah. Because if you want to make a living in it, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, you're better off, you know, getting, building a foundation, getting your life going, having a profession. And then if you love to do it, you know, you can buy a car and you can what whatever depending on how much money you can afford to spend yeah. I mean, can, there's other things you can run nasa you can run SCCA, you can run our wrl you can run there's a lot of things you can do um and if you're lucky enough to get to that point and you know you can find some footing but i mean you know chase the dream why not i mean yeah. 
Why not? Especially when young. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I meet a lot of guys too that are in their forties, fifties, uh, and I I always use you as an example. I was like, man, you, you still got time. You still got plenty of time. Uh, so if you want to go do it, go do it. Um, well, and here's the thing, and I tell people a lot of this, Andy. I mean, look, you worked for four. You worked a long time. You've got to this point where you can make some decisions. You're not getting any younger. You yeah. can't take that stuff with you. Yeah. You know, it's like, and you know what? If you if you if you want to do it, do it. Yeah. Do it sooner than later, because the calendar will come in and make the decision for you. Yeah. And then you don't want to be in a position where you look back and say, you know what? I should have done that, and yeah. but now it's too late. So do it. You know, yeah. and if you can afford to do it, do it and do it. And it's like your personal best. I mean, why do people join spending a lot of money golf, becoming, you know, belonging to uh, country clubs or big sailboats or different types of hobby? Everybody likes something different. So, yeah, you know, if you're a car guy, if you're a, you know, if this is what you love to do, mm -hmm. I mean, you work hard. Um, I'm not saying destroy your family to do it. No, but I'm certainly. And if you're a young guy, you want to do it, and you you're good at it. I mean, I was talking to a dad today, just today. Yeah, um, a good friend of mine whose son is really, really good, really, yeah. good. and he proves it all the time. He gets in these Porsches, and boom, yeah. and it's like he like he runs up front in this in the USAC Sprint Challenge, the Sprint uh, Porsche Sprint Series. I mean, yeah, really good. Yeah, they don't they don't have enough money, so yeah. we're trying to figure this out. We're trying to, yeah. who knows? You know, I mean, I, you know, um, but it's a different world, man. It's tough. It's a different right. So, right. and then there's other guys. One more thing. There's other guys, top drivers. I won't mention names, but they're drivers that you know very well. You've yeah. raced against them, yeah. and you've raced door to door with them. They're very good. They're drivers such as yourself. And they're not coaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they have a great big resume. Yeah. You know what they're doing? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> you're winning. racing. You're yes. racing. You're yeah. building your brand. You're racing. You're at the track. You're mm -hmm. on the entry list. I'm looking at you right there. You're on the entry list, you know? Yeah. I mean, you're you're in the eight hour. You're in you're you're coming to Watkins Glen. You're you're doing this stuff. Yeah, because you have a, and there's other guys. I mean, there's other Andrew Davis is another guy that runs a great coaching business, you know. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, which is weird, too, because when I got into the sport and I, I started at a racing school and, and being a coach for me, that was just a means to an end. I was like, I, I, I didn't think I was going to be a coach. I didn't I didn't plan to be a coach, didn't want to be a coach. I want to be a race car driver. You know, I yeah. thought. This is, I'm just going to do this long enough. Yeah, right. <laughs> to get into a race car, and then I'm not going to coach anymore. Right. right. Uh, but, you know, I, I've really come to love it. And it's, you know, now it's, I probably spend the majority of my time coaching and, and less so racing. But it's just funny how that ends up working out. But yeah, yeah. we all come from different ways. Back in the day, we didn't, we didn't, we really didn't coach. So we worked on the car. We, yeah. we were part of the team. So we, we were on the team doing something and yeah. trying to, you know, work our way into that driver's seat. And, uh, but um, I, I think, um, I mean, uh, it, it allows you to do it. I mean, you've, you've, you're running the races, you're in yeah. the races and you're, you're, you know, and I think it's important to do that. Uh, you're building your brand, mm -hmm. uh, you're building your reputation, you're building your brand and you're strengthening your resume when people look at you and say, gee, what's what kind of coach is Andy? Well, Andy's yeah, a very good coach. Think, yeah. And, uh, you know, and gee, whiz, is he a good person to choose to drive the car with me? Yes. Because he's going to make you better. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, I, and I, I think that's the, me that's the, that's what's going on now. You know, it's just like the shops that used to be racing teams that built race cars and race cars now they're they're it's it's providing prep and execution and it's a different kind of a race shop yeah it is yeah it's just total different one so um i another question i was curious of so there's all these races you know that i've had over the years and you've had many many more than me and um you know a lot of times people ask me what what race do i remember the most or you know what was the most important race to me um 
and uh, oftentimes the races that come to mind are not the ones where I was, where I won or even was on the podium, you know, but like the races where you get out of the car and you're like, damn, I gave it everything I had, you know? Um, so like there's, uh, I had a recent one at Austin, you know, where we didn't qualify very well and, and we had to start like 29th. And by the time I got out of the car, we were up to fifth, you know? So it's yeah. like, it's like little races like that where you're like, God, that felt good. Um, but if, do you have a race like that? Like, is there a race you look back on where it didn't get the, uh, the prominence maybe it deserved from your perspective? Well, the, the answer to that question is, is, and it goes back to ties into the story that I told you earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've got more than a, a few of those, but the one yeah. that always sticks out in my mind, yeah. I mean, one sticks out the one I drove with Jeff Bodine and we had this battle with Roush and Pruitt. We won the 500 up there. And that was a real hard, tough thing. Yeah. Um, you know, that 24 hour and the 12 hours. But the one that gave me the most satisfaction mm -hmm. was 1987 Columbus 500. That was a Columbus, Ohio street race. And it was, mm -hmm. in my, my opinion, it's still my favorite street race. It was, mm -hmm. it was a great event. Uh, it was a big event. And they did yeah. it for several years. And um, uh, 87, because remember, 86 is is where I had, I was in a V6 Camaro racing Roush in mm -hmm. Scott Pruitt. I had him covered. Mm -hmm. He was done. Mm -hmm. His tires, I'd, I'd run his tires completely off the car. <laughs> he was done. Yeah. Six laps to go. And I was following him. And yeah. I said, he had gotten so slow because he was just, he couldn't hook up the spin in the tires. He'd burnt the back tires off the car. I'm in this V6 and I got more power and more grip. And it's like, I could drive by him like nothing. So finally I, in 86, we go into the hairpin. I come up underneath him, give him a little tap on the bumper. I didn't mean to, but I did it. It's not a big deal. Yeah. So, but right. He took me across three lanes of asphalt and slammed me in the wall. Oh and wow! Both cars, and yeah. it made it made. Then back in those days, they had this thing, and they walked away. You know, they had these videos they'd sell. Yeah, and yeah. They walked away. I knew we were in a video. It's like NFL big hits. Yeah. yeah. Like, so yeah. yeah, and they walked. So all right. So that was devastating. Yeah. That was a huge deal because yeah. that that was almost a for me a, a career career changer because like I told you the story about IROC and NASCAR. I mean, who knows? But. The fact that he did that, and yeah. so the next year, yeah. we came back, mm -hmm. and same thing, squared up. Uh, yeah. We were probably on the front row, and mm -hmm. this year, I'm in a four-and-a-half liter V8. I'm in the Levi Garrett Camaro Peerless, and it's mm -hmm. it's the same thing. It's the gunfight between Peerless, mm -hmm. which is a covert GM, GM factory operation, mm -hmm. and Jack Roush and Scott mm -hmm. Pruitt, and I'll never forget – we come on that back stretch and we race through a trestle, like a, it went through a, a train trestle. You know, it's like, oh, wow. so it's like back in those days, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah, they, they just like, you know, don't hit the sides here. <laughs> Crazy. Um, but I remember that was the race that um, we were going down the back stretch and that Ford starts pulling me mm -hmm. and I was shifting at 8,800. And mm -hmm. that, that Ford starts pulling me, and I'm saying to myself, son of a bitch. Yeah. Well, I mean, here we go again. The Fords are so strong. And yeah. I just buried my foot, and I took it to 9,400. She didn't blow up. Yeah. Pulled the gear, and it was like in the movies. You know, he was going by, and then uh -huh. I went back the other way. Anyway, we had a, a – This is pre rev limiters. This is like – like, Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we had, and the motor turned that hard, and it pulled. Yeah. yeah. And – a four and a half liter V8. It was a one of a kind engine that was experimental that we could do that kind of thing in those days. But yeah. the, I won by a car length. Yeah. I came back and beat him. And yeah. Beat him. He was right behind me, right there. Yeah. And then that was the race that gave me more satisfaction than any race. Yeah. Is to come back, you know, it was sort of like the gunfight, you know, where the year before it was terrible, but this year I come back to prove a point. I would have beat you last year, kid. Yeah. But you crash me this year. I'm coming back. I'm gonna beat you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass you. You're not gonna, and, and I'm, you know, and and I'm gonna beat you. And I'd beat him, and uh, and it kind of blew him away a little bit too, because he's this young kid going, "How's this old guy getting me?" You know. Yeah. 
So yes. it was kind of cool. So that was that was that one. And I had a bunch of them, but that was one that really sticks out. I always tell Pruitt that too. <laughs> <laughs> I had a kind of a similar, not not exactly the same, like, but you know, for a short period there, there was a team uh, for those watching, like uh, called Black Dog Racing, which was very successful in our mm-hmm. division when we were racing World Challenge, and uh, they were in Camaros as well. And and I, I so badly wanted to drive for Black Dog because they had the nicest trailer, the nicest cars, yeah. the nicest equipment, yep. the best crew, like all that stuff. And uh, the owner was uh, Tony. And every off season, I'd call Tony or, or call, uh, you know, Ray Sorensen, his, his uh, manager. Yep. Like, guys, do you have a seat for me? Can I drive with you guys next year? Can you give me a test? Can you give me something? And and every year they pass me up for an, another driver for Lawson or for Michael Cooper or somebody else, you know, and uh, and so like the last year we were in GTS and the Camaros, uh, that was probably the, the lowest funded year I ever had. <laughs> that was probably the year where yeah, you remember you singing in our trailer. Yep. It was just me and my wife and like two friends that we had at the at the yep. racetrack every year. And we're in black. Well, we, used to feed, we used to feed you lunch. Yeah, yeah. Tires. Yeah. I'd buy you tires so you can make it. Yeah, yeah I used to beg for tires. And uh and, <laughs> and that car, that our freaking car would fall apart every weekend, man. Like something would break and we didn't have a spare, and it was just nurse it to the end, man. Just get it to the end. And uh I remember getting to Sonoma and I, I put the car on the pole. And it'd been a while since I've been on the pole, and Michael Cooper was in the black dog, you know, Camaro, and I was like my chance man i'm gonna stick it to them at least once this year <laughs> and we, we pulled off that win and so that that one always stuck out to me because it was no, so know. hard to get it man yeah so hard to get it mm-hmm. and you know you can't fake it andy so you know it's something to be proud of you worked for yeah. it you did it you don't it's not by accident it's not by luck it's just sheer determination and yeah. talent determination and talent tenacity all yeah. those things wrapped into one that um, I mean, you could have quit, you could have given up, you could have a lot of different factors, but you didn't, and yeah. and that's a high point of your life, and that'll you, that'll carry you on, you know. It says a lot about, you know, yeah, and I, and, you know. And I I, I kind of tell stories like that to to young drivers or drivers that want to get into this. It's like you're gonna have struggles like that. It's just kind of part of this deal. Oh yeah, and you'll make it through, man. If you just you just don't quit, like as long you said, as you're willing. Listen. Here's the bottom line. Mm-hmm. The, the the best way to fail, mm-hmm. the best way to fail is to quit. Yeah. yeah. If you That's quit, the way. <laughs> I mean, if you want to fail, quit. Yeah. As long as you're willing to keep trying, mm-hmm. it's, you know, you still, you're still, you still got a shot. You know, if you're willing to get up in the morning and give it another try, and that's what I tell my girls, and that's what I tell people. It's like, you know what? Uh, the good Lord gives us an opportunity to give it another shot as long as we're willing to do it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, in, and, you know, it's always the darkest before the dawn. So, <laughs> so yeah, man. in my story, yeah. I was like down to the last, 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 last. It was it. And then I got the deal. Boom. So back to this, you, you, Richard Petty. Yeah. You get told no 99 times and you get told yes once. On, man. You're not 99 times bad. You're not one. You're yes once. That's yeah. all that matters. You know? Absolutely. That's all that matters. So was there a, like a, you know, obviously that car for me became a really sentimental car and it's a car that a, a, a close friend, a sponsor still owns. And, and I'm always like, I want that car back, you yeah. know? Um, do you have a car like that through your career that you, you want in the garage just because? You know, honestly, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously the Hot Wheels car would be, mm-hmm. if I could have one, it would be the Hot Wheels car. Yeah. You know. um, we recently did, you know, the Levi Garrett car was pretty sentimental because of that team and that those years and, and the things we did with that car. Um, but... People ask me what was my favorite car. It was the Riley and Scott Mark III C, uh, mm-hmm. five liter Judd, mm-hmm. um, that that George Robinson owned. That yeah. I owned, and I love that car. And that car actually did a, a real. I'm I'm probably the only guy, or maybe the only I don't know who else has ever done it, but I did an honest, real 200 miles an hour road to land in that car. Yeah. And 200. Yeah, I hit 200. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I did it twice. I did it twice. Yeah. 
And so uh, they kept saying, you're 99.7, you're 99.8. I was like, I'm going to get that damn thing. <laughs> so I got 200. Um, couldn't tell the data. Yeah. But the car, you know, the car that I really loved the most, honestly, that I was the most tattooed was that last car, the, the Cayman, that mm -hmm. 73 Cayman. Mm. We took we because of what we did with that car and what we yeah. how we developed that car and, and that car is there's only one in the world one yeah. car and uh, a guy named Jeff Isringhausen owns it and it's one of a kind and it is a real real special race car and, yeah uh, that, car, man, that thing was so nice it was perfect it was perfect yeah and we 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 sweated bullets over that thing and. That was a great car. I mean, if I'd say which car, Jack, would you want to have? If you like, probably the Hot Wheels car because yeah. the Hot Wheels Camaro was the most recognizable race car in the history of the sport. Probably. I mean, yeah, I'd say so. so. Recognizable. Yeah. I mean, there was fifty-three different versions of that car made. Uh, Hot Wheels versions. Uh, it was in Happy Meals. It was in. We were in Toys, Kmart, Toys R Us. I mean, that car was everywhere. They made fifty-four different versions. Yeah, of the Jack Ball and um, um, uh, Camaro, yeah. Hot Camaro. But and I love that car. But that car, I never owned it. it yeah, was Brad Miller, I didn't build it. Yeah, um, you know it. It it kind of helped make me kind of you know well known. Yeah. But the the Cayman was we built that car from. We bought that car. And we like you with Camaro. Mm -hmm. We bought that car. We built that car. We all everything about that car. We did it ourselves, and that yeah. was a that was a pretty badass car. It was a real badass car, actually. So that's uh yeah, they're always the most sentimental. I think the ones that you put a little extra blood, sweat, and tears into. Sure, sure. But along that same lines, the other most common question I get is, "What's your favorite track?" You know, and I, I think for most race drivers. It's just the ones that become sentimental, right? It's not because they're the most fun to drive or they're the best track in the world. But for me, it's always been Sonoma. It's just been that, that track's always just been that place for me because I, I was just always fast there, you know? But but what what was it for you? Um, people ask me that question too. And it's hard to answer that in one, you know, as far as what my favorite track to go to. Um, yeah. But I... For years, the answer was Watkins Glen. Yeah, I loved I loved the Glen, but then again, you know, I rode America, Sonoma, Mid Ohio, car, places that I won at, that I had yeah. great success at. I had great success at Sonoma, Mid Ohio, um, mm -hmm. all you know, Watkins Glen. Yeah, you know, surprising enough, I had the terrible success at Atlanta, which is where I live. But, <laughs> but, but, I've never had much luck there either. <laughs> yeah, I, I've not had good success here, but I've won. I've won some races there. Yeah, and I've won fast there, but um, but you know, like tracks that I like Mid Ohio, I've won in everything I ran there. I'm on, <laughs> I won in every class, uh, GTU, GTO, Trans Am, Camel Light, and World Challenge. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, World Sports Car. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, so all five of those, and same thing with Watkins Glen. Some yeah. I, I did real well there, and Sonoma did really well. At Sonoma, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, is there when do you coach at all, Jack? I like, used to. I don't yeah, anymore. No, not anymore. When no. you when you did coach, was there like um, was there one one thing that you like focused on with the drivers you worked with? Yeah. Was there like the most important thing? Because obviously we're talking to a bunch of people that. You know, are going to the tracks, they're doing HPD, you know, they're, they're getting started in this sport. And so they're always looking for advice. Uh, what, what would be the most important like coaching tip? I think for yeah. me, I'm a little old school, you know, yeah. I, I, uh, and you wonder, you know, back in the day, how did guys like Mario Andretti and AJ and those guys to mention two, uh, yeah. Gurney, how did they get out of an Indy car, get into a champ car, get into a stock car, how did they do all that? Because that's what they did. And they all, yeah. and they did them all pretty well. And we didn't have all the, you didn't have the driver's aids in those days. And, um, and most of my career, I didn't have any driver's aids either. And I never really raced a car with paddles. I drove paddle cars, but you know, mm -hmm. and, and when I was pro racing, I always shifted. I never got the luxury of this, you know, <laughs> but I, I, it was like, 
I the the one thing that I think they're missing now mm-hmm. is is if I had to say what is the one thing you really need to learn, mm-hmm. and that's to feel the grip. Yeah. To feel the grip. Yeah. And really think about that and really understand that because that's going to give you the ability to manage and read the car and get to drive it to that edge. And the better you are at feeling the grip, um, the better, the faster and the better driver you're going to be. And I think so many drivers today just get in the car and drive it because they have so many driver aids and they just don't think about that. They just let the car do the work and they just stand on the gas pedal, stand on the brake pedal. But if, if you, if you, and you have to think about it, right? Think about the grip. You have to think about what have I got here? What have I got here? And the reason why those guys could drive all those cars is because they felt the car and they let the car tell them, what do you got here? Yeah. And they manage the platform because that's what you're doing. Yeah. Managing a platform. So, and yes, you have aids and stuff like this. Personally, I'm not really used to a lot of aids. I never had them. Yeah. My traction control was my foot. Yeah. And my ABS was my, my, my brake pedal, you know, I mean, my right foot. Mm-hmm. Well, foot, depending on what car is in, but <laughs> I think that's what missed. I think that that mm-hmm. that should be added to the conversation and you know brought in and 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 and, you, and added to the mental. In other words, when the when you come in, the car comes in and say, "How's the car?" Yeah, tell me about the car. It's not. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> How's the car? Well, the car's good. The car's really good. <laughs> um, how's the car? Oh, the car. Uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah, it's good. No, no. Tell yeah. me about the car. What's the car's doing? What is the car yeah. doing? When's it doing it? How's it doing it? You know, and if you don't think about it, you know, turn in. Is it boom? What is it doing in the middle of the corner? Is it, you know, because, and the other part of this is visualizing, you know, be able to close your eyes or not close your eyes, but visualize the lap to see the lap and, yeah. and be able to visualize that. And I know many times I would all night long, I'd run qualifying laps mm-hmm. and I'd run and run. And then I'd say, I, okay, I know what's going on now. I'm right in the middle of that corner. I'm doing this mm-hmm. just a little bit tight, snug in the thing, you know, yeah. and I didn't realize when you're out there in the heat of battle doing that, but when you go visualize and yeah. you think about it, you like, and all when you're, when you do that, when you put wheel in it, you know what you're doing. You're putting the brakes on. Yeah. So if you can make an adjustment, if you can tell the engineer, hey, I, this is what's holding me back, and they can dial that out, now you're not doing this. And when you do this, yes, maybe it turns, but you're scrubbing. And any time yeah. you're scrubbing, what's in between scrubbing? When you're scrubbing, you're driving, you're pushing the car, the wheels sideways across the road. Yeah. And you're scrubbing, and you it's the same. If you're scrubbing, it's the same thing as reaching over your left foot and dragging the brake pedal. Yeah. So those are the things that I would say that I add to the, to, and I don't know, maybe the, the young guys teach it, but I, I, a lot of drivers I talk to, I said, you ever heard of that saying? They go, no. <laughs> so you know, I mean, there's a lot of times where I wish I you know, could, could put them in an environment to do just that. I mean, actually I just worked with a gentleman the other day and we actually had the ability to use a water truck. You know, we we yeah. we, we let it down at a corner and at a track, and and that was fantastic. I, I wish I had the ability to do that every with everybody mm-hmm. I worked with. Um, you know, the other thing that I find with the the newer modern cars is that they're there's the drive rates are so integral in the design of the car that when you turn the things off, sometimes the car just behaves like an, a, a lunatic, you know, and it's like, exactly. oh, I, I don't want this guy to, to drive it like that, <laughs> you know, but you can't turn it off. Right. I understand. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it, and they work better with it. So, I mean, but you, you got, there's places to go. Like you can, you can definitely go to places and experience and you can go to rally schools. You can, there, there's ways to do it though. Well, it, it, I, Andy, I don't think it's just necessarily sliding the car, but Mm-hmm. It's sort of like when we had the Cayman and we were qualifying, you know, 40 races, I had 16 poles. Yeah. And we'd do most of them in one lap. Out yeah. by once and boom, hit it. There you go. Yeah. And because we would, 
work on tire pressures and temperatures and stuff to where when I, as I felt that grip coming, mm -hmm. I felt that, you know, the grip. And as I felt the grip, I drove into it mm -hmm. and, and the car, you know, I could do it, you know, yeah. because the car would have let me do it. Um, but only because I felt it, I, yeah. I was able to ring the bell to get yeah. the number. Uh, you know, if I didn't feel it, um, the other drivers, um, you know, my teammate was one of them, you know, you could put new tires on the car, didn't make any difference. Same lap time, yeah. <laughs> Same lap time. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, and so many drivers, you know, if you, and I would tell your drivers and your guys and guys that are listening out there, when you go out there and you do all this practice on old tires, use those old tires, you know, run the car, get the car handled. When you put those stickers on, you know, if you're not, if those aren't good for at least, I mean, bare minimum yeah. half a second and should yeah. be more than that. Yeah. Um, then you're not, you're wasting you're not time. You're not getting it. And yeah. that's, that's really important. I think a lot of guys don't, you know, don't do it. Don't, um, don't, don't see that and don't feel that. And I think that's, that's a big part of it, you know? So, um, yeah. so what, what was it? At, so all the way to the end, like, like I always remember you being up front. So what, what was the thing that, that caused you to be like, I'm done? Like what, when did you, you, you what made you make that decision finally? Well, th there was a couple of things. Um, cause you were, what, how old were you when you, you finally said I'm done? 68. Yeah. So my plan was to go, my plan was to go for two more years. Yeah. And bring in a young guy mm -hmm. and, um, you know, bring in a young guy and we were going to bring him in and then manage because I, I said, Hey, these guys, they don't, they don't understand the, the commercial part of racing, but I do. So yeah. if I get somebody that's fast, that can get the job, then I can take my team with him and I'll go out and sell the deal. Yeah. You know, I'll sell the deal. And, yeah. uh, you know, because we have some value here, mm -hmm. that was my plan. Mm -hmm. And, um, what happened was when we when we got to the end of and we were at Laguna Seca and mm -hmm. I had this great team, but we'd sort of gotten the end of the road on the development of that car and the club sport was coming because of my efforts with the Cayman, you know, yeah. the club sport was born. I yeah. mean, it would have never happened if I hadn't done what I did. Yeah. So, um, and I'm proud of that, you know, so Mr. Yeah. That's, a lot of people call me Mr. Cayman, but I mean, <laughs> it's true. I mean, yeah, no, that, that was, was the club sport. Before. I mean, it, it was, you know, and they, so at that time, Jens Walter came up to meet with me and sat in the lounge and he said, I said, so what do you have next? And he said, we don't have anything. Mm -hmm. I said, you have nothing. And he says, we got nothing. <laughs> All we have is this club sport and yeah. that for PCA. Yeah. So, he says, you can do that if you want. Yeah. And I said, well, Jens, that's a lose-lose thing for me. Yeah. Because, you know, first of all, you know, all your club guys, PCA guys, here I come rolling in with my crew, and I'm going to run this thing. And if I win, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a jerk. Yeah. If I don't win, I wasn't that good anyhow. Right. I said, but we would win. I promise right. you we'd win. Right. And we would be the best team with those cars. There's no doubt. Yeah. I said, but that's not what you want. That is not what you want. And I said, first, and they, and I told him this. I said, you know, I've got a pretty good name in the paddock. I've got a pretty good reputation. And I said, I don't want to be that guy. I don't yeah. want to be that guy. I said, Tom Brady shows up at a local, you know, uh, you know, city football league. And is that yeah. fair? That's not yeah. fair. Yeah. And it's not fair for me to do that. So I don't want to do that. And I don't want to be that guy. And he did, they didn't have another car. So my partner and I, we looked at, we said, where do we go from here? We really didn't have anywhere to go. I mean, what do we do? I mean, I mean, we, he said, if you can get somebody to jump in here and do it with you, you know, we can keep it going, but we sort of got the end of the road. And then the other part of it for me was when do you stop? Yeah. Um, my last race, I was on the pole with two track records, and um, I ended up second, mm -hmm. thanks to the BOP. But 
Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> another, that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> that's a whole other discussion. But you know, I, I love Chris Wilson who beat me. He says, did I, how did, did I make it? Was it too obvious? <laughs> I said, well, Chris, you know, you did what you were hired to do. I got it. Yeah. yeah. We finished second and yeah. we were good and we were fast and, you know, and that, that all kind of thing. And I always wondered, I always, I felt like, you know, I don't want to be the guy that hangs in there long enough, you know, because a lot of guys hang in there and now yeah. they're 8th place, 10th place, 12th place. They're yeah. slow. And yeah. they hang in and it's like embarrassing. They're like, why don't you just stop? Yeah. And I didn't want to be that guy. Um, yeah. And I sort of, I said, so when do you quit? When do you know when to stop? And I, I kind of looked at it and said, you know, I've been doing this a long, long time. And I could keep trying to climb. Remember, I had to go out and find the money. Yeah. I got to keep digging. And I was on the phone 14 hours a day. Yeah. And I mean, I worked, I got up in the morning, I was on a mission. Boom, 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 boom. And I thought, you know, I looked at my age and I said, you know what? I'm, I don't want to get to a point where I they said, Jack, so what did you do? What did you do with your life? I race cars. What else do you do? That's all I did. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I want some time to do something else, just, just to do it a different way. Yeah. And I want to look at life a little differently. So yeah. we chose to just sort of stop and we were going to build this big shop. We had all these giant plans and none of that. We just sort of, and we sold the team. Buzz actually bought the team, but bought all my equipment and Buzz McCall. And, um, and, uh, you know, I took a year off. And then when, when GT4 came with, you know, the new formula of homologated factory built cars, that's when I called Greg Gill mm -hmm. and said, you know, I, I, I could probably do a real good job being your series manager. Yeah. And he said, I think that's a really good idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, cause I wanted a job and I told him, I said, I don't want to, I'm not interested in, you know, working from dust to dawn, but you know, yeah. it's in the sport. And so for me, it's the perfect job because I know yeah. everybody, everybody knows me. Um, and I, my job is to make the sport better help teams, help drivers, help put things together, uh, always make it on things better. I mean, today I've got, there's two things that's going to change next year in the rule book and you guys are going to like it. You're going to like it. And, um, so we've done a lot of things to make the sport better, you know, yeah. and, uh, and we're going to continue to do that. And, and that's where I'm at. So I'm, you know, I, I do I, I, do I miss it? Um, sometimes on a really nice day, walking down when you guys are getting ready to go out, mm -hmm. I always say, "Damn, I wish I was going out too." You know? <laughs> but you know, I've I've sort of moved that passion over into dirt bikes. Yeah. So, and I love my dirt bike, and I love riding single track high adventure stuff, and yeah. um. And like we are going to go on our adventure ride one of these days. I know. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to get an 890 or something like that. <laughs> but yeah. we just need to get into this new house we're building up in Blairsville. But yeah. um, yeah, that's it for me. I mean, I don't. I'm not. Re I drove a lot of races. I mean, I drove a lot. I won 40 pro races. You know, some people did more. Some people did less. I won the Rolex. I won Sebring twice. I won the Miami. I won just about every at every single track. There, there's yeah. only a. I'd have to really think about what track that I didn't win a pro race at. And, yeah. and there's not, I'd have to think about that because I can't just give you that answer. Uh, but um, I think I had a pretty good career. I mean, I, some people did more, some people did less. I did what I could do. Um, I, you know, I was in um, I rock twice, which they invite you for, you know, yeah. you get invited to that. That was a real honor. I did some Bush stuff, uh, Bush Grand National stuff. I was really good at it. Um, and, um, I, you know, drove with some good teams and stuff like that and had some fun. But, I mean, I don't know, you know, just uh, help build the Cayman Inter Series, uh, help Harley Haywood and I, you know, mostly Harley, but I was with him. When we did the Porsche Sport Driving School, we, we got that started, and, and it's much bigger today. Yeah. But 
we did a lot of things. You know, I saved some people's lives along the way. I go to the <laughs> life saving life saving life saving life saving. a whole other story. No, we got to hear one of the life saving stories. <laughs> so, um, but um, and then I have one other question for you. So tell me one of these life saving well, that's stories. It. And I, you know, I would tell the, you know, I'll leave you with this, and you can ask me one more thing, but I'll leave you with this. Okay. So I tell young guys this. I tell, look, at the end of the day, at the other end of the road, um, how are you going to be thought of? Mm -hmm. You know, a, a guy, uh, NBC News or somebody like this, it wrote Atlanta. I remember turned twelve, and I was in my probably in my twenties or thirties. He said, Jack. How do you want to be thought of? Mm -hmm. And I just thought, interesting question. I said, I just want to be well thought of, you know, at the end, I'm doing this. But mm -hmm. I can tell you that I, I would tell you that it's not about how many races you've won or what you've, uh, you know, like accomplished on the racetrack. Those are all personal accomplishments that you would you 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 personally accomplish because you chose to do this. So, you know, how many, how well you did at that, that's your own personal thing. That has nothing to do with how you're thought of. It's, it's at the end of the road, at the end of the, when you look back, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be judged by the relationships that you've built and the reputation that you've earned through the years as in the career in, in racing and motorsports. That's how you're going to be judged. People don't look at a driver and go, Hey, this, I've just, you know, uh, he's that guy's won 40 races, got 60 poles, got this guy. It's just like they don't know nothing. No, you know, I'm looking up your stats every day, man. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's all about that. It's it's what to me that's 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 what it is right there. So, um, you know, do what you can do, do what you can do. Try as hard as you can try, and and that's what you did. And like I say, I, some people did more, some people did less. Some people had much bigger careers. Some people had much smaller careers. So, um, yeah. I mean, I, when I got into this, I just want, I, I, I just want to race. I mean, well, the, exactly. the day I lined up on that grid for the first right. time, I thought I'd already made it. You just want, you just want, yeah. you're right. You yeah. just, the fact yeah. that I'm, I'm here, I'm like, yeah. look at me, pinch me. Yeah. I did, yeah. I did, you know, I did like Rolex. I did 25 Rolexes. That's yeah. a lot. I did like 20, Fun, man. 20 Sebrings. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, lot, man. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, you know, it's, you look back, I mean, I'm what I'm 73 now, and I'm still in racing, yeah, you know, I'm still in the sport, I'm still involved with the sport, still going the track, I'm not driving, I could, yeah, you know, a lot of times I think, you know what, I it would be if, if I we could put together a little deal because I'd be a bronze. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm think like, I, I think I could still, as when it comes to bronze drivers, uh -huh. I don't really think I could still go out there and set them on fire. I, I've got a feeling. So, well, so that was the last question I wanted to ask you before we part ways is when was the last time you drove a car in anger, man? When was the last time you were on track? What was the car? Was it at Laguna that last race? or well, you the last? Okay, the last race I did was a race with, and it was fun, with Buzz uh -huh. McCall. Uh-huh. And a boxer, he did okay. those nine hour races at Barber. Yeah. And we started dead last in the rain <laughs> and we won. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, um, and it was kind of a cool deal because at the end, I was leading and they said, We got to save fuel. Yeah. So slow down. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, All right. So tell me what you want me to do. So now I'm running second and I'm running third and I'm, you know, we're falling back because I'm saving fuel and that's all we can do. Yeah. 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 And then they call back and they said, we changed our mind. We <laughs> Just go. <laughs> I said, how much time is left? And they just, I forget what they said, you know, 45 yeah. minutes or yeah. something like that. Maybe it was less than that. And I said, stay off the radio. Just give me a split. <laughs> and then we ended up, I passed the guy on the outside I sucked him into a, a bad move. I got him on the outside, and I beat him by one car length at the line. Uh, he was devastated. Uh, <laughs> he was devastated, and he thought he never saw. He thought I was. He thought I was over there, but I was over there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was uh, that was really fun. And and I would do things like that now. You know, fun stuff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But and uh, you know, 
uh, that's it. I mean, that's that's good. I mean, I've, I I can't I can't say I missed anything. I can't yeah. say that I, you know, it's like what didn't you? Do? If I had one regret, is I didn't go to Lamar. Mm -hmm. It was in those years. We didn't want to go to France. We want to, you know, yeah. we just didn't. I don't know. We just didn't want to do it. And uh, and then we went over there once with George Robinson when we were doing the open cockpit cars, and we were strong. We could have done it. And George says, you want to run the race or you want to run all season? Uh, yeah, that's an easy, that's an easy. And decision. I thought, well, if we do one race, I know George is going to say, well, if I'm only going to do one race, I'm, I don't really think I need to pay you all year. Yeah. Yeah. And I had two exactly. kids. I had two girls at the time. So I'm thinking to myself, I probably need to do all season, you know, because I was getting paid pretty well at those years. And uh, <laughs> we were doing all right. so, um, but that was, I guess that's a regret, you know, yeah. uh, I would say to, other guys out there to listen. If you want to do something that's just fantastic and you want to have some goal, spa, mm, go yeah. to spa. That's on my list. That's one I haven't done yet. I, that's high on my list. Spa is awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I, I wish I would have done spa. If I'd have known what it was and how cool it was, I would have done everything to get there. Yeah. And uh, But, you know, you think about it, Andy. If, mm -hmm. if they'd have had the rating system, it would really help me because – I probably could have continued and you know, it doesn't work for some people, but yeah. I'd have been a bronze for 15 years. Yeah. I mean, for the people watching right now, like they have this driver rating system. So yeah. I'm a silver and uh, a bronze is technically an amateur. That's not getting paid to yeah. drive or the loophole for Jack here is age. Right. So we right. get beyond 50, you're automatically a bronze, right? Well, over, I think it's over you know, at 50. You lose one rate rank. Uh -huh. And I and back in those days, I was uh, I, that was a rating, mm -hmm. and I always had a, an A license. You know, mm -hmm. I was an FIA grade grade A FIA mm -hmm. license, mm -hmm. and the only thing higher than that was uh, the super license. Mm -hmm. So I had those. So I would have been like maybe gold or platinum, mm -hmm. you know, probably in through those years. But then when you get to 50, you lose one. When you get to 55, you automatically go to bronze. Wow, so man. I would have been in my last race. I was a 68. So, I mean, if we would have been doing the rating system, I mm -hmm. probably could have made a, a pretty good living. Yeah, uh, that's it. <laughs> you know, just being a bronze and just kind of going from team to team and just yep. filling in. Oh, and man. Uh, I, I could have probably kept going for, you know, a few more years like I wanted to, especially with paddles. That's the other yeah. thing. See? Yeah, it's narrow the margin a lot. Yeah. I mean, I had to shift. I had to shift. I had to, you know, and that was one of the things when we sold the Cayman. Like people, so like well, one of the issues with the Cayman, it was blindingly fast, mm -hmm. but it had a six speed. Yeah. And somebody mentioned to me one time, they said, you know, Jack, most drivers today don't know how to drive a stick shift. Yeah. And it's going to be race one. And I thought, well, that's interesting because, um, you know, that's true. And I'm I'm like an old musician that just picks up a guitar and just can strum it and go with it. Right. Because that's all I ever did. Yeah. And so I thought, God, if I if I was driving a paddle car, I mean, that would have easily extended my career. I could have kept going. And so but maybe at best I didn't. And here we are. And yeah. Maybe one of these days I'll get into a car and just see. Um, I'd like to drive a GT3 car. I think I'd still be pretty quick at it. I Yeah, I, I don't doubt it a bit. Yeah, <laughs> well, thanks for your time, man. I, I appreciate you joining me today. And uh, hopefully we can do another one of these sometime, too. Anytime, <laughs> Andy. You're one of my favorite guys. You're a very accomplished uh, professional. And, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, as a series director, I'm – Pleased to have you in our paddock, and um, I appreciate it. I, I highly recommend that anybody out there listening, if you're looking for a good, and I'm not just saying this because if it wasn't true, I wouldn't say it. But if you're looking for somebody really to work with you and help you cultivate your skill and make you a better driver and you know uh, chase that dream, Andy Lee would be one of the top choices. So thank you, my friend, for allowing me this time with you, and yeah, see you at. Uh, Walk see you in spring. Spring. Yeah. I won't be at the Glen. You're see. not going to the Glen. No. I'll see you at Sebring and then I'll see you at Indianapolis. Sounds good, man. All right, buddy. Good later, Jack. Thanks. See you, buddy.